Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the COP27 Japan Pavilion AP Plus Seminar titled Formulation and Implementation of NAFTA in the Asia Pacific, Establishing System to Promote Adaptation Toward the Achievement of the DGA. This seminar will begin in five minutes. Before the seminar begins, I would like to inform you of some housekeeping groups rules. Today's seminar will be a hybrid of online and in-person. Online participants other than the speakers will not be able to use the microphone, camera, or chat feature. Please refrain from recording the meeting. Please note that our staff will be recording and photographing the session to prepare the seminar's minutes. I've found that the internet connection here may be unstable. I hope nothing bad will be happen. If you have questions during the seminar or panel discussion, please post them using the Q&A feature. Due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if we cannot answer all your questions. Lastly, but not least, we would we would very much appreciate if you can answer the Zoom survey after the seminar to help, help us improve for the next year. The seminar will start soon. Please wait a moment. So it's time. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all and thank everyone for coming. 
I'm Keiko Yoshikawa, the Deputy Director of Center for Climate Change Adaptation, National Institute for Environmental Studies, NIS, in Japan. I'm very honored to serve as the chair today. We will now begin the COP27 Japan Pavilion AP Plus Seminar, Formulation and Implementation of National Adaptation Plans, NAPS, in the Asia Pacific, establishing a system to promote adaptation towards the achievement of the Global Goal on Adaptation, GGA. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Hiroshi Ono, Vice Minister for Global Environmental Affairs, Minister of the Environment in Japan, for opening remarks. Please. Thank you very much for your introduction and good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment of Japan, I would like to extend my heartfelt welcome uh, to all for today's event at the Japan Pavilion. As climate change has escalated, its negative impacts have been widely emerging. The involvement and the collaboration of diverse actors is essential to cope with and adapt to the increasingly intense and complex impact of climate change. In Japan, according to the Climate Change Adaptation Act established in 2018, stakeholders are working together to promote adaptation actions. We updated its climate change adaptation plan last October, in which a set of key performance indicators are identified in policy areas with high significance and urgency. Japan also focuses on capacity building for policy makers around the world. In, 19, uh, in 2019, we launched AP Plat the Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Information Platform. It provides for necessary scientific knowledge and web-based tools to assist in the development of skills for formulating adaptation policies. Japan is committed to supporting developing countries by sharing scientific knowledge and best practices through AP Plat. Adaptation measures work well when tailored to the national and socioeconomic conditions of each country. A one size fits all approach will not work in terms of the methodology to assess and evaluate the effectiveness of adaptation measures. In this perspective, the formulation and implementation of National Action Plan or NAP will give each country an opportunity to understand its current adaptive capacity and progress over time. Therefore, NAPs contribute to the global goal of adaptation by providing information on the status and progress of collective adaptive capacity, as well as uh, by sharing good practices globally. We hope that today's discussion will address uh, such perspectives. Let me turn to the new UN Early Warning for All initiative to ensure every person on earth uh, protected by early warning systems within five years. Japan has already expressed its support to this initiative and urged all countries to join us. An early warning system is an effective measure to improve adaptive capacity and avert and minimize loss and damage, in particular, people's lives against climate disasters. Immediately responding to the launch of the UN initiative, uh, the Ministry of the Environment of Japan plans to develop early warning systems in the Asia Pacific region through public private partnership. As the first step, Ministry of the Environment of Japan will start building 
a prototype early warning system in Asia early next year to pave the way for further development. We hope that today's seminar will contribute to improving adaptive capacity and promoting the use of APPLAT in your country or region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ono. I've been reminded of the importance of, of adaptation, NAPS, GGA, and sharing experience among the Asia Pacific region. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Yuji Mastomi, section head of the Center for Climate Change Adaptation at NIES, to introduce us to today's seminar. Dr. Mastomi, you have the floor. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yuji Mastomi from Center for Climate Change Adaptation. And I'm one of the organizers of this seminar. And thank you so much for coming, you're coming to AP Plus seminar at COP27. And before going to the main session, I would like to explain the objective of, of this seminar. And I think all people recognize that uh, Adaptation plan is quite an important element in adaptation. But at least I have a lot of questions. For example, how to make it, how to adapt, how to make adaptation plan. That is a very important basic question for me. And also, what is good plan? What is effective or what is not effective plan? This is question. And also how to implement it. That is more critical issue in adaptation processes. And also what are challenges? I, I do not understand uh, what, what kind of challenges do you, do you have? And also what are needed in the adaptation to promote adaptation in Asia Pacific region? That is question for me. And also more difficult things is what is global and adaptation, which is called GGA, which is described in the Paris Agreement. And more importantly, I think how to link national adaptation plan with GGA or how to link local adaptation plan with GGA. GGA. So I think there are a lot of questions in adaptation planning. So how to address these questions? That is a key question for me and key question in this seminar. And I think sharing experience is very good way to address this question. So the objective of this seminar is to first to highlight the significance of NAP formulation and implementation. And then, and then we also to review the current situation, good practices, initiatives, and challenge. And finally, if possible, we hope to propose concrete action to promote adapt adaptation in the Pacific region. That is a final achievement, final objective, final goal of this seminar. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mastomi. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, very uh, good questions, and that is the reason for sharing uh, the experience among the people coming here. <laughs> it is very uh, understandable. So next, let us move on to the next session uh, titled Adaptation in the Asia Pacific Region. Dr. Rind and Stevenson will be moderating from here. Here. She is the head of knowledge management and scientific affairs for the 
Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, APN. Dr. Stevenson manages over 50 national and regional projects annually and the APN's capacity development and regional research programs. She also plans dialogues that cross the science policy practitioner interface, and she engages with international science policy bodies and platforms, including APPROT, IPCC, and UNFCCC. She is a perfect person to moderate this session, and I am pleased to have her here with us today. Linda Sun, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, what a lovely way to start this present <laughs> this session. Um, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome to COP27. Welcome to our session. We are very time limited today. I'm going to move straight into our speakers' sessions. And um, before we kick off, I'm going to ask our speakers to keep their presentations to within nine minutes. You will have a two minute warning and then a one minute warning. And then unfortunately we will cut you off. Um, and so to get things started, I would like to invite um, a very good colleague of mine, uh, Mr. Genichiro Tsukada, but first I will introduce his bio data. So Mr. Genichiro Tsukada is the director of Cl the Climate Change Adaptation Office, the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. Uh, MOEJ. He has over 25 years of experience. I can't read this. He has over 25 years of experience in the field of environmental administration, including overseas experience in Indonesia, the Netherlands, as well as experience as director of the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research. He's my former boss. Um, he also has, he's heading the climate change adaptation of MOEJ uh, since July 2021. Sukada-san, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Linda-san, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Genichiro Tsukada. I'm Director of Climate Change Adaptation Office from the Ministry of Environment Japan. And it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to talk about uh, the implementation of the uh, climate change adapt adaptation plan in Japan today. Next slide, please. First, uh, let me introduce the Climate Change Adaptation Act, uh, which was enacted in 2018. Uh, this is a single act uh, for the purpose of promoting adaptation measures based on reliable scientific knowledge. The act takes the comprehensive adaptation program, including no. Ministry of the Environment shall implement climate change impact assessment every five years, and the climate change adaptation plan needs to be revised accordingly. The National Institute for Environmental Studies is designated as an information platform. Local governments are asked to develop their local adaptation plans and designated local adaptation centers. And the national government uh, takes measures to promote international cooperation and adaptation businesses. Next, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the climate change impact assessment report released in December 2020 by our ministry based on the latest scientific findings. You can see some examples of uh, key impacts by sectors at the right side of this slide. Uh, for instance, we can expect a decline in the yield of quality of rice, uh, increased frequency of landslides, and large scale coral bleaching, according to the report. Next slide, please. This slide shows an overview of the climate change adaptation plan revised in October last year. Uh, totally seven basic strategies are shown at the plan including aimed climate change adaptation in every uh, relevant policy, uh, promote adaptation based on scientific knowledge, and promote 
uh, adaptation according to local backgrounds. In addition, monitoring and evaluation of the progress on adaptation based on a PDCS cycle uh, is introduced in the plan. I will explain the, the details of M&E of the plan later. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows adaptation measures in the natural disaster sector shown at the climate change adaptation plan. Various measures in the field of rivers, coastal areas, and mountain areas are shown in this slide, including the promotion of the river basin disaster resilience and sustainability by all initiative shown in the figure. Uh, this initiative, officially positioned in relevant acts in 2021 in Japan, uh, is aiming at integrating structural and non structural countermeasures to promote flood control measures in cooperation among all st stakeholders in each river basin. Next slide, please. Uh, let me make an introduction of one of our efforts related to nature based solutions. Uh, our ministry is considering eco DRR related with water flood disasters and it's developing an eco DRR potential map. As shown in this the slide, potential map uh, created by overlaying biodiversity information, hazard maps, and re relevant policy information. This map visualizes potential suitable areas for eco DRR and helps policymakers and local governments to implement eco DRR efficiently. This map is intended to be used as a supporting materials to identify areas to be preserved as wetlands or rice paddies or to restore eco ecosystem functions through natural regeneration as shown in the figure. Our ministry plans to publish a technical guideline and materials for nationwide map early next year. Next slide, please. Then let me introduce about the implementation of the climate change adaptation plan. This slide shows about the progress management of short-term measures. In order to manage progress under PDCA cycle, a couple of measures have been implemented every fiscal year. First, grasp and confirm each policy based on the plan. And second, grasp the numerical values of key performance indicators or KPI set and consider setting additional KPIs. In addition, the Climate Change Adaptation Promotion Council takes the lead in following up the progress of the plan every fiscal year. Next slide, please. This slide shows about M&E of progress in mid to long-term adaptation measures. In order to monitor the progress of adaptation through the implementation of the plan, the progress of indicators and targets set from the perspective of establishing and spreading adaptation at the national, subnational, and citizens levels will be managed. In addition, as there is no established method to accurately grasp and evaluate the progress of adaptation, such a method will be developed. Specifically, output and outcome indicators will be set for each sectoral and basic measures, and the method to grasp, grasp the progress of climate change adap adaptation is being studied. Next slide, please. This slide shows schedule for progress management and evaluation of the plan. The current plan will be evaluated in, in fiscal year 2026, and the results will be reflected in the next revision of the plan scheduled for the same fiscal year. Additionally, an interim report will be prepared in fiscal year 2023, the mid-year of the plan period. Next slide, please. Let me make an introduction of the Climate Change Adaptation Promotion Council, uh, chaired by Minister of the Environment, and consisted of high-level officials from relevant ministries and agencies. The national government takes the initiative in promoting adaptation measures, including the implementation of the climate change adaptation plan in a comprehensive and systematic manner by holding meetings of the council regularly. Next slide, please. Let me make a brief introduction of the promotion adaptation efforts at the local level in Japan based on the Climate Change Adaptation Act. Local governments are asked to develop local adaptation plans as well as establish local adaptation, adaptation centers as information hubs. Currently, many local governments have already developed their adaptation plans or established their centers, as you can see in this slide, and those numbers continue to uh, increase steadily. 
Two minutes Additionally, the National Institute for Environmental Studies gives technical advice and assistance to local governments and centers upon request. Next slide, please. Lastly, let me uh, introduce my takeaway message. I need to skip the introduction from the first to the third breath point due to the time constraint, but I already explained these items in the previous slides. The last bullet point is another message. It is important for each country uh, to adapt, uh, grasp the status of the promotion system and institutional arrangements for adaptation measures through the development and implementation of NAPs and uh, regularly check the progress of these measures. It is also crucial uh, uh, to encourage action and support for adaptation in each country by sharing good practices. These efforts uh, will become important initiatives uh, to achieve a global goal on adaptation. Next slide, please. One uh, minute. That's the end of my presentation. Oh, Thank perfect. you so much for your kind <laughs> attention. Thank you so much. So we have gotten off to a great start. Thank you very much, Mr. Sukada. And he will elaborate more during the panel session. Um, our second case study is on the implementation challenges of national adaptation plans in Timor-Leste. And um, our bio data is now coming up. I would like to invite Ms. Justina Oria da Costa. Bello. <laughs> She is the uh, she works at the National Directorate of Climate Change. Sorry. She works at the National Directorate of Climate Change, NDDC, NDCC, under the Secretary, Secretary of State for the Environment, Timor Leste. Uh, Ms. Uh, Bello is technical lead for the Montreal Protocol Program and its implementation. She supports the implementation work of mitigation and adaptation issues, including the Montreal Pro Protocol and other environmental treaties. Uh, Ms. Bello supports the alternate national focal point for UNFCCC, the Green Climate Fund, and the Adaptation Fund. Ms. Bello, the floor is yours. Hi. Um... Good morning, everyone. Good evening and uh, good afternoon uh, for our um, um, friends <laughs> online. Um, I'm, uh, since the, we have limited time, I'm gonna go ahead with the presentation of the National, um, national Adaptation Plan uh, implementation challenges that we face in uh, Timor-Leste. Um, next, please. Okay, so first, um, this is a very straightforward roadmap. We came up with a roadmap from 2016 to 2021. Um, right now, we are still at 2022, sorry. And right now, we are in the process of the implementation. Nothing, um, there's not much that we have done, but we are in the process and the challenges we faced. Um, at the moment during the implementation um, is, is very much affecting how we are uh, in the process of the implementation. And um, the objective of, um, um, of this national adaptation plan is to, to integrate, um, integrate climate change adaptation into sectoral and municipal program and, and, and plans and actions. And, um, in NAP, we have identified um, seven key uh, priority sectors, sector priorities, seven, and they are infrastructure, biodiversity, and ecosystem, health, agriculture, water and sanitation, disaster risk reduction, and tourism. And um, each priority is assigned is, uh, with its lead agencies while recognizing that the several ministerial ministries will need to be involved in fully uh, implement each activities. Um, given the multi multi-sectoral nature of uh, most adaptation activities. And um, these priorities will serve as the basis for immediate adaptation action into Malaysia with 27 programs. Next, please. 
these are the key implementation challenges. First one is the finance, of course. Everyone's been talking about that. It's either mitigation finance or adaptation finance or loss and damage finance. That's what we all hear. And that's the first thing that we face, that the challenge of um, the financial challenges. And, uh, and uh, the other challenge is the capacity building, technology development transfer, lack of guidelines and information and lack of m, &M &E framework. Now, I have already put there that each of key implementation challenges was the finance. We need the finance in terms of us, in terms for Timor Leste to implement this national adaptation plan. And right now we we currently work in the readiness proposal, which we submitted and being reviewed by the GCF. We have done several um, other projects such as the ready, readiness. Um, our the national director of climate change Timor Leste is the uh, is actually directly um, accessing the GCF fund to to implement uh, the the readiness projects, and uh, we are one of the LDCs country that is faced with limited human resources capacity to implement its its. Um, generally, a lot of uh, programs in the government. Um, here, in terms of the coordination of project, in, the, uh, in terms of coordination, we are very much limited. Uh, um, human resource very much limited in coordination, project proposal, development skills, implementation map, integration of map into the sectoral municipal planning processes, the engagement with research institution. That's what we are looking forward to. Um, in terms of um, uh, research engagement with uh, research institution and other agencies for data gathering, harmonizing processing, such as geospatial um, data and hydrometeorological data. That's very much we are having. Um, that's what, that's what we're lacking. And the next one is a technology development transfer. Go back. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's the um, technology and inform information adaptation and mitigation, including early warning system. Another one is the lack of um, guidelines that we not we do not have, uh, you know, guidelines in terms of the awareness raising for on the levels of implementation, including budgeting. Let's say um, our member of government, some of them do not even understand a, the the essence of the integration of uh, um, climate change in all the sectors even though we have the national adaptation plan it feels like it's just like a bible that sits there and it's very hard to kind of implement it in sectoral levels and the the last one is the lack of uh, the ME framework for the nap implementation um, since we have not yet there in terms of implementation as a whole so it's and we are also lacking that many framework at the moment um next one please yes so takeaway message um so the first one is seeking financial and capacity building support to implement it to implement nap and to ensure that the um climate change is integrated in, um, in the sectoral, all minister ministerial um, plans and programs in national level and municipal level in Timor Leste, it's very much centralized and not yet decentralized. And that is also part of the challenges because as I mentioned, we have limited human resources. So it's very, very hard to decentralize at the moment. So everything is centralized. So, and we are seeking support for project proposal development, um, like project ideas, concept notes, full pro project proposals, um, to access funding for NAB implementation. That's the another challenges we face, and we're trying to make sure that in during the negotiation, we wanna we we pointed out that it's very hard for LECs. Um, including Timor Leste to access, you know, the GCF fund. Jeff, two minutes. There's so many, um, so many um, criteria to be fulfilled. You submit it, and just a small uh, project, and you have so many the papers to submit, and it's 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 hard for especially if you have limited human resources. 
Um, and also right now we already have a climate change uh, policy in place in order to guide. Uh, but yeah, that's very much in the, we are just in the initial of the implementation. That's all from me, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bello, for, especially for staying on time. Um, our next speaker will be joining us online. He is um, Mr., and I apologize for the pronunciation, Mr. Maud Mizanil Hok Chowdhury. Uh, Mr. Chowdhury is the additional secretary of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, or MOEFCC, and he is the National Project Director of National Adaptation Plan in Bangladesh. Mr. Chowdhury, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, presenter. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the in-person and the virtual attendee. This is the cover slide of my presentation, Status and Challenges of National Adaptation Plan in Bangladesh. Next. This is the presentation outline. Next. And this is the preamble. Bangladesh has been proactive and adept in climate change adaptation mandated by our constitution. Bangladesh he enforced climate adaptation efforts with formulating National Adaptation Plan of Action 2005, Bangladesh Climate Change Strategic Action Plan 2009, Bangladesh Delta Plan, and recent the Muji Climate Prosperity Plan, emphasized by the Article 2 of Cancun Adaptation Framework a later commitment from Article 7 and Article 9 of Paris Agreement, Bangladesh took the initiative for the formulation of National Adaptation Plan. Therefore, Bangladesh National Adaptation Plan has been formulated and approved by our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina on 31st October, 2022. Next. These are the principles of National Adaptation Plan. National Adaptation Plan has been formulated based on the eight principles. Most important process of formulation is that it is country driven, fully participatory, pro people, gender responsive, and inclusive. The process is also transparent and incorporates both top down and bottom-up approach. Next. These are the consultative process of National Adaptation Plan. In the formulation, as we followed the banded bottom-up and top-down approach, more than 35 formal stakeholder consultations. Hundred key stakeholder consultation and focus group discussion conducted. 
approximately 5,000 people consulted at local level, district level, and national level. A large number of copies, draft national adaptation plan circulated for review and validation among stakeholders and different ministries and field administration also. Inclusion of gender, youth, person with disabilities, social disadvantaged, ethnic communities are given highest priority in every stage of the, this consultative process. Next. These are the glimpses of stakeholder consultation. Next. Devising sectors of national adaptation plan. The national adaptation plan focuses on eight distinct sectors, such as water resources, disaster, social safety, and security. Third, agriculture, port fisheries, aquaculture, and livestock. Fifth, urban areas. Sixth, ecosystem, wetland, and biodiversity. Seventh, policies and institutions. Number eight, capacity development, research and innovation. First six sectors involve the physical implementation of climate change adaptation, whereas remaining two sectors can catalyze an enabling environment to advance the national adaptation, smooth implementation. Next. We have identified element climate stress areas has been identified in the national adaptation plan on 14 hazards. <laughs> Next. Mr. Chowdhury, you have two minutes remaining. Yes, yes. Challenges of... Next. Next. These are the remarkable adaptation initiatives by the government of Bangladesh. Next. 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 Mr. Chowdhury, you have one minute remaining. Yes, next then. Next. Slide 21. Next. Benefits of NAP, next. Inclusion capacity development, next. 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 Challenges of Bangladesh NAP implementation. Broadly six implementation challenges have been identified, managing the required huge investment, engaging private sector for climate adaptation, increasing readiness of country, developing fully operationalized, ensuring integrated management, required the 
formation of prescribed policy landscape, ensuring multi-sectoral and interministerial coordination. Next. Thank you all. Joy Bangla. Mr. Chowdhury, I really appreciate you staying on time. Um, just to let you know, I will be providing a summary later and I have captured all of your key points. So don't worry. And we look forward to having you on the panel discussion. Um, Thank you next, uh, we have a video message from Professor Rajib Shaw. Professor Shaw is uh, a graduate, he works at the Graduate School of Media and Governance at Keio University in Japan. He is engaged in research, education and disaster risk governance, governance, urban resilience, climate change adaptation, and emerging technologies in disaster and climate change. Professor Shaw is co-founder of a Delhi-based social entrepreneur startup, Resilience Innovation Knowledge Academy, or RICA, and is chair of the United Nations Science Technology Advisory Group, or STAG, uh, for disaster risk reduction. And, and he's also Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rajiv Shaw from Keio University in Japan. I'm sorry that I can't be there in this important event. Uh, but let me talk about a little bit on my own experience on the IPCC 6th assessment report, especially on the Asia chapter, and try to focus a little bit on the key issues of adaptation in Asia. Uh, as you know that um, our, the overall global risk landscape is changing very uh, rapidly. So, of course, if you see the different types of risk, be it environmental risk, economic risk, geopolitical risk, so this has been always evolving. Back in 2020, when we saw the Uh, and so infectious disease became a very strong risk. But with the infectious disease, when we had the analysis of 2020 in 2021, I'm talking about the World Economic Forum Global Risk Outlook, they pointed out that some, some of the digital divide or the digital power concentration uh, has become the new emerging risk. All of us, we understand that during COVID, uh, we have actually turned quite a bit our whole lifestyle, whether it is work, whether it is education, whether it is healthcare, to more on the digital ways. Uh, we are very privileged to have the digital connectivity, but possibly uh, the whole world does not have the equal digital penetration. So there has been an inequality which has been, uh, which has been uh, developed and which will possibly be a major future uh, uh, risk uh, in connection with other environmental risk, be it climate change, be it uh, disasters, be it biodiversity losses, and so on. So when you talk about, say, for example, a typhoon early warning system, and now that we have quite strong presence of uh, app-based or mobile phone-based early warning, but if there is a failure in the digital system or if certain group of people, say, for example, the aged population who are living in small rural area, even in case of Japan or any other develop, developed or developing countries, I think to reach them uh, through the digital media will be a quite challenge. So my first point here is that um, we need to put the climate change perspective, disaster risk reduction perspective in the overall gro global risk landscape, which is very dynamically changing. And a traditional risk reduction or risk management process possibly uh, is not uh, applicable anymore unless we make proper uh, measures. So that's my point number one. Coming to the IPCC, what we call the upper level statement, of course, in Asia, flood, regional drought, fire, this will be, this has already increasing 
and this will increase. We will see more impacts on the human being, but also different types of species, both in land and ocean. And this is what we call a statement of very high confidence. Uh, very high confidence in IPCC means that we have a uh, larger number of science which points out to this particular conclusion and uh, all the science actually the larger number are pointing to the similar type of conclusion so that's the ipcc upper level statement what we say now among the different types of issues like we need to in this particular chapter um, asia chapter we have focused very strongly on the different types of risk driver and what we call the detection and attribution. So uh, we have a very strong uh, heat wave, we have very strong coastal urban flooding, then biodiversity losses, dust storm, and sea level rise. And another very important thing is the urban heat island. So these are possibly a major, uh, uh, there are also many other issues in total around 12 to 15 risk driver, but among these, um, the one which I mentioned are possibly having more, more stronger impact. And of course the agriculture, the water and the health sector will have a major challenges for that. So that's the um, uh, second part. The third part is, um, of course, uh, like we have been um, earlier in the fourth assessment report, fifth assessment report, we have been talking about uh, very specific different types of hazard. But in this assessment report, one of our major focus was that it will be more the complex compound disasters compound disasters or complex disasters are like two or three different types of hazards possibly occurring together and that will have a more severe impact and also the cascading effect of the disasters will be very important so again uh, our adaptation practices which we possibly used to have possibly one type of hazard is again under major challenge unless we need to actually shift our adaptation practices to more cascading complex and compounded hazards so that's a very very uh, important part we also focused quite a bit on this maladaptation or short term adaptation so by maladaptation, I, for, I say, say for example, most part of Asia has the um, uh, rainfall fed agriculture, but certain pockets, they have also irrigation agriculture. And when we have less rainfall, we need to get more water from the underground through different types of pumps, whether it is the tube wells or deep tube wells and so on. And which is possibly good for immediate, um, immediate uh, problem, which is the water scarcity in agriculture sector, but it is actually drawing the underground water table much, much below. So unless we make a proper planning for the catchment area, which recharge the water, it's very difficult to actually uh, make a proper balance of the water system. Another example, say for example, when we say that there are the sea level rise, we often make the sea wall to protect the communities, to protect our properties from the sea level rise, which is again, temporarily, possibly an adaptation practice. But then the longer term ecosystem impact for that on the marine biodiversity is again, a major challenge. Uh, so there are many this type of examples, like how we make a proper balance between maladaptation and this what we call the short term to medium and long term adaptation. Another aspects of adaptation is the limits to adaptation. Say for example, uh, we have certain species like corals, which are possibly the adaptation limits has crossed. So possibly we with adaptation, we cannot protect that type of coral reef. When we have the small coastal uh, like the um, uh, 
the communities who are living where in the coastal areas who has relatively lower socioeconomic condition, or even the small landholder farmers who are possibly focusing on the rainfall, uh, rain fed agriculture, they are possibly the limits to adaptation is a major challenge. And there, people need to shift from this adaptation to another aspect. So these are possibly some of the issues which we discuss very strongly. Another important aspect is uh, this climate resilient development pathways, what we call. And in we have focused quite strongly in different types of development pathways and the governance and the technology becomes the core of this de development pathways. And within that governance, we have strongly recognized the uh, Japan's Ministry of Environment's Regional Circular and Ecological Sphere model which is called RCS model, uh, that has been a major governance mechanism where we have a very strong urban rural linkage of different types of resource and this broader planning like we all understand the cities will be at risk due to climate change but cities and the nearby rural area how we make a broader uh, uh, resource management or the resource planning i think that's one of the major issue and my last comment is on different types of disruptive technologies or emerging technologies we called the i always say that today's emerging technology is tomorrow's essential technology so how we actually use this technology for different different types of adaptive action. So the adaptive governance has become a very major pillar for different types of adaptation mechanism in future. There are many different issues, but I think I have limited time, so I will stop here. And thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Rajiv Shah. It's really unfortunate that he couldn't make it uh, today. I don't know what's happening up here. Something wrong up here. Um, my the next speaker is uh, Miss Akani Matsuo. Miss Matsuo, can you can you can you check? Sorry, just a technical difficulty. Yeah, it's this presentation needs to be closed, I think. Okay. Ms. Uh, Akani Matsu is a policy researcher um, in, uh, adaptation and water area at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. Uh, her she works in poly research, policy research and international program coordination on climate change adaptation, currently mainly engaged in the development and coordination of capacity development pr programs under the AP plat. Ms. Matsuo will talk to us today about the status of the adaptation plans in the Asia Pacific region. Matsuo-san, sorry about that. The floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Linda-san, for your kind introduction. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Akane Matsuo from the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, or IGES, in Japan. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity to be part of today's important session on national adaptation plans. IGES is one of the core organizations supporting the several activities under APPLAT, and today I'm going to share the primary findings from the survey on the current status of adaptation plans in the Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific that we conducted with the support from the National Institute for Environmental Studies. As you know, the NAP process under the UNFCCC was established as part of the Cancun Adaptation Framework in 2010. And today at COP27, after over 10 years, NAPs have frequently been recognized as effective source of information to assess adaptation progress and needs, especially under the discussion on global goal on adaptation and global stocktake. Of course, until now, numbers of technical and financial supports have been provided to accelerate NAP process by UNFCCC constituted bodies such as LEG, 
ONFCCC funding mechanisms and bilateral donor agencies. However, there are a few surveys providing an overview of the status of adaptation planning, especially focusing on the Asia-Pacific region. So in this regard, we conducted a survey with the objective of taking a snapshot of the current status of adaptation plan implementation in the Asia-Pacific under this ap plat initiative to understand the current status, gaps, and needs to enhance the collective actions to promote adaptation planning in the region. The survey targeted the 39 countries in the Asia Pacific, which consists of four sub regions. There are 10 LDCs and 15 Cs in the region, while Timor Lesot, Kiribati, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu are both LDCs and Cs. As of September 2022, all countries in the region have submitted their NDCs at least for one to four times, and all LDCs have submitted their NAPAs and all seats have submitted their national communications. On the other hand, only six countries out of 36 non-Annex 1 countries have submitted their NAPs, and only seven countries out of 39 countries in the Asia Pacific sub have submitted their adaptation communications. So in this survey, we picked up the most recent documents among the national communication, NDC, NAP, or adaptation communication submitted to the UNFCCC, and only one latest document was selected for each country. And we analyzed those documents by using the uh, quantitative framework consists of four elements to assess the components of adaptation plan documents, which are assessment of the current and future climate, priority sectors, implementation strategy, and monitoring and evaluation. So here comes the results. Out of 39 countries in the Asia Pacific, more than half of the countries included basic climate information data such as temperature, rainfall, sea level rise, and climate hazards in the adaptation plan documents. When it comes to the priority sectors mentioned in the adaptation plan documents, agriculture and food, health, and water are included in the most of the countries. On top of uh, those, disaster risk reduction and human settlements and infrastructure are highlighted as priority sectors, especially among the least developed countries. However, a small number of countries have clear implementation strategy in the adaptation plan documents. For example, only 18 countries mentioned that they reflect adaptation measures in each sector's plan. Regarding monitoring and evaluation, though many countries recognize its importance in the adaptation process, only 11 countries included m and framework in the adaptation plan documents. As a supplemental analysis, we also looked into the websites of major climate funds on top of adaptation plan documents to understand the current status of financial and technical support to the NAP development and implementation. We found out that over 20 countries in the Asia Pacific have been supported by SCCF and GCF, and five countries have been supported by the NAP Global Support Program or NAP GSP. And Germany, USA, EU, and Japan have supported three, more than three countries uh, in the Asia Pacific for their NAP uh, formulation and implementation. In summary, our survey identified that while most of the countries in the 39 Asia Pacific have submitted their national communications and DCs and NAPAs, less than 10 countries have submitted their NAPs and adaptation communications. In terms of the contents of the adaptation plan documents, while most of the countries are clear about their basic climate assessment information and priority sectors for adaptation measures, very limited number of countries clearly mentioned about the implementation and MRA strategies in the adaptation plan documents. So from now on, we need to keep track on the status of the adaptation plan development and implementation at the regional scale like this. And also more detailed analysis is required to understand the current status, gaps, and needs on financial and technical support for adaptation plan development, implementation, and its update so that we can enhance and accelerate the collective action of, to promote adaptation planning in the whole Asia Pacific region. You can find uh, more detailed information on this survey on the APPLAT website. 
So this is all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, Matsu-san, and thank you for keeping within your nine minutes. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Yuji Masutomi. Ah, he's there. <laughs> Dr. Masutomi, you've seen him already. He is the section head, Center for Climate Change Adaptation, or CCCA, at the National Institute for Environmental Studies. Dr. Masutomi is engaged in research on impact and adaptation assessment of climate change on agriculture, and he's been doing that for 15 years. He's responsible for the overall development of the APPLAT website and for the development of scientific tools such as Future Climate Projection Data Viewer and Downloader Climocast. Masutomi-san, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Yuji Mastomi. I'm working for the Center for Climate Change Adaptation, and today I would like to introduce briefly introduce the APPRAT. APPRAT is uh, as a Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Information Platform. And first, I briefly explain what is APPRAT. APPRAT is a web-based information platform. So what is web-based information platform? Just website, okay? So APPRAT is a website on climate change adaptation, especially focusing on Asia Pacific region, okay? And APPRAT was established in June 2019 on the G20 meeting. And and the objective of APPROD is to promote climate change adaptation by three main activity, including scientific information and development of scientific tool, and also capacity development is more important our activity. And some people say, why does Center for Climate Change Adaptation, CCCA, develop APPROD or manage APPROD? Because, okay. because we have Climate Change Adaptation Act and it has been enforced since December 2019 and the Article 18 of the Act State Promotion of International Cooperation. And that is a real statement of Article 18, the national government shall develop and international system for sharing information on climate change. A little, a, little, a little bit difficult to understand. An international system for sharing information on climate change. That is exactly EPIPRAT. So we are developing and we are managing EPIPRAT in CCA. And from now, I would like to explain some of main two main function of EPIPRAT. Now, first, I would like to explain, I would like to introduce the main scientific tool, Climacast. And Climacast is CMIP6 climate viewer and downloader. Okay. And as you know well, CMIP6 is the latest future climate projection data set. For example, IPCCL6 report is based on the CMIP6 climate data. And by using Climacast, you can easily get the data, latest data, CMIP6 data. And in this crime case, you just select your country, your province, your state, and your city, and your town. And then just one click, you can get the data 
future climate change, including temperature increase and pre precipitation change. Okay, so this kind of tool, I think, really, really useful for your adaptation planning, adaptation action in your country, in your city. And the other main tool of uh, EPIPRAT is Climate Impact Bureau. This is map view, GS based map view. And you can uh, understand geographically uh, climate change impact and adaptation effect by using Climate Impact Bureau. And this Impact Bureau provide a wide range of sectoral climate change impact, including extreme weather, sea level rise, health, agriculture, water resources, and ecosystem. So this kind of information, impact information and adaptation uh, information is quite important for adaptation planning in your adaptation processes. So, and also we also, have one of the main functions of the AP project is capacity development. And we have uh, several resources, including e-learning courses, webinar information and tools. And then uh, the right-hand side is show that the, some of the list of the e-learning courses. For example, oh, I, I cannot send it. The top one is a development concept note on GCF. Yeah, see, yeah, already mentioned that GCF funding finances is quite important in the adaptation process. And the second one is also accessing the GCF for adaptation. This is the YouTube course, okay? So everybody can access to this website and then everybody they can run the, the uh, GCF adaptation uh, course. And also we can uh, provide a video, uh, video course about the Climicus. So as I mentioned, the Climicus is a main tool for getting the latest future climate projections. So you can easily learn the, uh, the, about Climicus by using this web, uh, this e-learning courses. And also most importantly, yes, uh, I'm so happy to announce that we have just opened a new page on adaptation planning last Monday, just last Monday. And then, yes, and then, then this new page is about adaptation planning. And this page is focusing on adaptation planning. And for example, we provide pra practical information in all processes of adaptation plan development. And the left hand figure show the processes of the adaptation planning. And then the detail of the each processes are described in this page. So you just, you just follow this page and then you can make the adaptation plan and then you can understand the monitoring and evaluation process in the adaptation planning. And also, we also give the guidance on national adaptation plan and the other like uh, GS, uh, Global Stock Take or GGA in UNFCCC processes. So yeah, uh, in the introduction, I, I, I had a, some, I showed some uh, question in the introduction yeah, I don't know though what's the relationship between the NAP and the uh, GGA or something, but yeah, this figure shows, it, it is quite difficult to see, but uh, this figure shows the, the relationship between NAP, NDC, GST, GDG or something. So you can easily understand the, the relationship between them in this page. And also we also give information on the status of adaptation planning in Asia Pacific region. So, in this page, you can understand the other countries' station, status, other countries' situation. So now we are preparing the country report. You have this, two minutes. Okay, three minutes? Two minutes, okay. Yes, so country report will be available next April. I think these other countries' state situation is very good difference for your country, for your country adaptation planning. Okay. That's all. So exactly, uh, EPIPRAT aims to support adaptation in Asia Pacific region by providing scientific information, developing tool and capacity development. And we hope to bridge between stakeholder and science. That is a final goal, final objectives. Okay, and then now you can see that uh, new mathematical equation, EPIPRAT is equal to stakeholder bridge. Bridge is a new mathematical operator. 
and science. Okay, so AP plot is equal to stakeholder bridge science. This that is uh, our final goal. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Masutomi, Dr. Masutomi, for staying on time. Uh, even though I heckled you, I do apologize. Okay, I guess the next presenter is uh, is actually myself. Um, I guess this young lady is going to help me. So. Hello, everyone. I hope I can stick to my nine minutes. I'm sure I will be heckled by the staff. Um, as you all know, I'm Linda Stevenson, and I'd like to talk to you today about a, um, a new project being led by uh, IGES and APN, and it's an initiative on locally-led adaptation in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, I would like to, to highlight that this presentation was prepared by myself, uh, together with uh, Dr. Benaya Shivakoti, who's also leading this work uh, at IGES Ahayama uh, headquarters. Okay, but a little bit about locally adapt locally led adaptation, I'm sure you all know, but you know, the Asia Pacific uh, region is, is diverse and adaptation plans need to be tailored to, to individual countries and regions as one size does not fit all. We've heard that this morning. Um, there's been a paradigm shift from top down to bottom up in developing and implementing adaptation plans, creating local centric policies and generating a sense of ownership. Locally led adaptation is ensuring that local people and communities have decision making power in adapting to the impacts of climate change, as well as the resources, agency and support they need to make sound investments in climate adaptation measures. In terms of the current situation on LLA, uh, the Global Center on Adaptation, GCA, has defined eight principles for locally led adaptation, which is being implemented, not implanted, but implemented on the ground. Although few documented studies are available in the Asia Pacific region, Global leaders at COP, COP26 did commit to a shift towards the LLA principles and pledged 450 uh, million U, uh, US dollars for initiatives and programs. Let's see, I don't think I've got the right presentation up, but that's all right. Now it's, it's the wrong presentation, which is a pity. But anyway, bear with me. So there's a need to combine global knowledge and local knowledge to implement adaptation plans effectively. At the same time, we need to continue empowering, I apologize, empowering local communities as they underestimate themselves on the one hand and then tend to wait for external support on the other. So the objectives of this particular project, the overarching goal of the project is to catalyze local adaptation innovations and localization of NDCs through regional partnerships among knowledge institutes sharing a common purpose. Specifically, the project will identify and address capacity gra gaps through four main objectives. These are, Supporting the understanding of climate risks and vulnerabilities at the local level. Supporting locally led adaptation innovation, stressing the use of indigenous traditional 
and local knowledge systems, supporting bankable ideas towards establishing local adaptation innovation hubs, and strengthening local adaptation planning, implementation, and governance systems to ensure inclusiveness, participation, transparency, and better localization of NAPs and NDCs, thus ultimately feeding into the global goal on adaptation. I have the Zoom app on here too, so it's a bit difficult to navigate. Let's see. Okay, so the APN IGIS project team um, and our local model case study sites. So our key activities, uh, the project activities will primar primarily focus on model case study sites and they'll cover three sub-regions, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia and Fiji. Um, in South Asia, we're focusing on a local study site in Nepal, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam and the Pacific in Fiji. We have local counterparts, the University of the Sunshine Coast, um, based in Australia, but working in Fiji. We're discussing a case study site at the moment, ADC in Vietnam and ECMOD in Nepal, as well as a range of other partners. This particular project will lead into the regional area and we have a range of partners uh, in terms of our timeline we will have a range of partners that we will engage with as the timeline moves forward so our model case study sites uh i'm trying to compete with noise how am i doing on time it's not moving that's strange yes i i do apologize i don't know why it's not moving yeah, it's strange. Only my presentation seems to have problems. <laughs> yes, it's the wrong one that's up as well. That's that's also a problem. I will just yeah. uh, restart and sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Let me restart. <laughs> I'm almost finished. Yeah. All right. So I do apologize for that. Um, our local model case study sites, they will act as hubs for locally, locally led adaptation, innovation and learning, regional cross learning and collaboration. And there'll be a blueprint for promoting locally led adaptation actions in the region. They'll be led by local partners. Youth engagement will be involved. There will be a focus on ITLK systems. And uh, we hope to build enduring capacity at the local level. Our outputs and outcomes, we will have guidelines and tools on local adaptation planning and implementation. We expect to have model cases and lessons on local adaptation innovation and upscaling and impact generation. I think one of the important key points to mention here is that we're not starting with new case study sites. We will build on case study sites that are already on the ground and already working in locally adaptation, uh, local adaptation, uh, local level adaptation initiatives. So the regional context is crucial and we are developing a partner driven approach, building partnerships for sustainability with the key organizations that you might have seen earlier, although the slide was small, uh, we highlighted, in addition to those working at the model case studies, we hope that our approach will gather support for promoting locally led adaptation, innovation and sharing of lessons, engage in a collaborative approach with potential regional knowledge partners to promote and capitalize on existing knowledge tools and guidelines that they have already developed and importantly as part excuse me as part of the project's regional outreach it's expected that the outputs and outcomes of the project will be integrated into the asia pacific climate change adaptation platform particularly the capacity building component 
And um, with that, I do have some key messages that not weren't partic taken particularly from um, our project, but more from a local, uh, sorry, a global Gobeshona conference uh, led by ICAD. And um, the takeaway messages in realizing locally led adaptation and engagement of all actors is that the co-creation of knowledge and solutions is key to facilitating effective and sustainable adaptation action. We need affordable and contextualized technology to ensure workable locally led adaptation practices. LLA has to be a part of NAP and NDC implementation to establish effective linkages with national and international policy processes. And we need a phase-wide approach under a long-term planning and sustained local, national, regional partnership to truly realize the LLA potential for a paradigm shift to transformative adaptation. Capacity building should not be one off. I think we all know that. Rather, it's like a friendship and a continuation of partnerships should be encouraged and should be ensured. And with that, I hope I stayed within my 10 minutes. I have no idea, but I will finish there. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Maybe I now need the, the other mic. Is it okay? So I am multitasking today and I would like to start our plenary session. Is it okay? I see Masutomi San say, ah, okay, there we go. So here are our panelists. Um, I am moderator and a kind of panelist too. Uh, we have Sukada, Mr. Sukada, who's already taken the floor. We have Ms. Bello, who's taken the floor. We have uh, Dr. Masutomi. And online, we have Ms. Zakia Afros, the Joint Secretary of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change uh, of Bangladesh. And um, Ms. Akani Matsuo, a policy researcher, as we know, she spoke earlier. And um, with that, I would like to pose some key questions, but perhaps, uh, Maybe I will stand here so I can see the screen. Maybe I'll have a seat. That might be a better idea. So we have three questions today. And I'm going to pose these three questions to our panelists, both online and uh, sitting here in the room. We have three questions. What progress has been made and what are the main challenges of the NAP formulation and implementation including monitoring and evaluation in the Asia Pacific, and how can these challenges be effectively addressed? Actually, before that, I was supposed to provide an overview of the presentations. So while you're thinking of that question, let me just uh, provide a very brief overview of what you all talked about, and then we can move on to the questions. So Mr. Sakada noted that comprehensive adaptation efforts have been made based on Japan's 2018 Climate Change Adaptation Act. The country's adaptation plan is revised every five years based on impact assessment reports that summarize key scientific findings. He expressed the importance for countries to grasp the status of promotion systems and institutional arrangements for adaptation measures through the development and implementation of NAPs. He underscored the importance of regularly checking progress through M&E mechanisms. And I think that speaks to number one. Um, he noted they're crucial to achieving the global goal on adaptation set out in the Paris Agreement. On behalf of Mr. Pinto, Ms. Bello stressed the implementation challenges of NAPS. She focused on key areas of finance and capacity building highlighting minimal human resources for coordination, proposal development, implementation, and integration of NAPs into planning processes. There is a lack of technology development and transfer guidelines and information on awareness at all levels. And of course, again, a lack of an m and &E framework for implementing NAPs. 
Mr. Chowdhury talked about the National Adaptation Plan. Bangladesh's NAP was formulated through a lengthy consultation process and approved by the Prime Minister uh, just last month. So congratulations to, to Bangladesh. Having said this, Mr. Chowdhury stressed various methods to realize the achievement. He highlighted the vital challenges, including again, developing a fully, fully <laughs> operationalized m and &E framework within a short time frame. Bangladesh is now working towards a readiness acceleration program, awareness raising, capacity building, and skills development. Dr. Matsuo discussed the status of adaptation plans in the Asia Pacific region and provided a snapshot generated from a survey on the current status of adaptation plan formulation. She stressed that less than 10 of the 39 countries have submitted NAPs and adaptation uh, communications, although about half of the countries mention the implementation of m and &E strategies. Overall, what's required is a more detailed analysis of the status, gaps and needs of the countries, including the financial technical support needed for adaptation plan development, update and implementation. Dr. Masatomi introduced the web-based AP plat platform that aims to support adaptation in, in the region via three key pillars, scientific information, developing tools and capacity building for adaptation. He highlighted a new feature just launched on the 7th of November. And uh, this feature provides practical information on adaptation plan development, guidance on NAPs and other UNFCCC processes, and information on the status of adaptation planning in the Asia Pacific region. I focused on partnerships for locally led adaptation, and I won't continue too much on that since I, I was the last speaker. So back to our panel discussion questions. And I'm sorry, uh, Slavka, if you could put those questions back up. Um, I would like to pose the first question to three of our panelists. First to Ms. Bello, what progress has been made and what are the main challenges of the NAP formulation and implementation? including monitoring and evaluation in the Asia Pacific, and how can these challenges be effectively addressed? If you could answer within one minute, that would be fantastic. Thank right. you so much. All right, thank you. Um, first thing, um, I've already mentioned during my presentation earlier that even though we have been faced with challenges, we're still moving forward slowly and we now have our own um, climate change um, policy in place, um, we have not have yet um, m and &E in place due to limited human, human resources capacity. So um, these challenges will be best addressed if we could get, we, if we could receive more um, financial, um, financial support. And also we have to, uh, make sure that um, our technical uh, person staff in our office could uh, could be connected to the research institu institutions in, ter in terms of uh, um, formulation uh, research in, in terms of um, climate. Uh, sorry, my, it's because of negotiation. My head is like spinning oh, we ended very late um so um these everything comes back if you talk about these developed countries everything comes back comes down to a financial support we have submitted our national adaptation plan we just submitted our um uh, ndc just this week and and um we've made the um, uh, very much as uh, sorry i'm not feeling well i'm sorry <laughs> yeah so uh that's the uh maybe i could go, go come back to to the question but i um we are not yet made a lot of progresses but we are just started um to do so and we hope that soon we can even 
we heard from in Japan, we know that AP Plat. I met or one of the AP Plat uh, members, uh, staff, or in 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 Bonn this year, and we were talking about the challenges that we face, and we got connected with AP Plat, and we're very much um, ha happy that AP Plat is now providing lots of tools that could help us. So that alone can al already tackle one of the challenges that we have. So I don't know, I don't, uh, due to Linda, I don't want to talk a lot, but that's exactly what we need. You're helping us in one way or the other. Yeah, so thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that response. I'd love to pose the same question to Miss Avros, if you are online. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, Good evening to you all. And uh, in every country they are uh, joining here. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my thanks to, uh, the, uh, to invite me as a panelist in the uh, uh, Japan uh, COP uh, Pavilion. Uh, I uh, actually, I uh, did my master's in uh, Japan in Hiroshima University, so I have a soft corner for uh, Japan, so I am, I feel honored for, to be here. Thank you very much for your uh, question. Actually, in, <clears throat> we are uh, uh, just uh, formulated our uh, national adaptation plan, um, uh, just uh, uh, the last uh, last month, it <clears throat> it has been approved by our prime minister, and now uh, this is the <clears throat> sorry, and now this is the time to time to implement the national uh, adaptation plan. Actually, we uh, we started our journey uh, uh, long back on uh, on two thousand five by implementing. Uh, uh, national adaptation, uh, national adaptation plan of action, and then uh, Bangladesh climate change strategy and uh, action plan. And this is <clears throat> the this is the first time we uh, uh, formulated our national adaptation plan. And this is a continuous process, and uh, this is a continuous uh, 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 of a journey of that from 2000 since 2005. And. Uh, <clears throat> What uh, progress have been made? If I say that uh, we we uh, actually implemented a lot of activities uh, uh, regarding adaptation initiatives from since 2005, and uh, we actually uh, incorporated and we uh, um, uh, in in this adaptation plan we incorporated these. Um, uh, these things, these uh, for, uh, the past initiatives and past uh, replicate the pa past successful stories. You know, we uh, we have a, a Bangladesh uh, government with uh, uh, own resources. We made a Bangladesh Climate uh, cli uh, Climate Trans uh, Trust Fund, and uh, with a. Um, uh, uh, approximately uh, 460 million we have already spent uh, to implement 800, uh, 800 uh, uh, projects uh, related to adaptation. So, and now uh, we, uh, you see in the presentation of uh, our uh, um, NEP uh, formulation that there is a lot of uh, um, uh, consultation and a lot, a lot from in every, uh, uh, national, local, subnational, and national level. All the <clears throat> is uh, all uh, um, uh, their opinions and their, all the um, uh, experiences. These these are gathered that are uh, incorporated in this uh, uh, document. And <clears throat> the, uh, our NAP is prepared in an inclu inclusive way and based on indigenous knowledge and uh, on adaptation. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it uh, emphasizes the people like gender, uh, person with disabilities, youth, and ethnic communities. And the main challenges uh, we are, uh, I think uh, we formulated the NAP. It's very, uh, very much uh, uh, comprehensive and uh, inclusive, but, and it, it formulated in a participative way. And now uh, we, uh, in, uh, in, the, in our NAP document, we uh, uh, suggested uh, a, a lot of uh, suggestions and uh, 
uh, there are broad challenges have been mentioned uh, though we uh, we, uh, we are not in a position or we, we are in a, a way to implement uh, uh, in the uh, in the future so uh, we uh, will uh, we will uh, will progress with these uh, uh, the main uh, main challenges that uh, that is uh, mentioned in th this document the main challenges that, that are uh, uh, um, in in uh, our document are uh, uh, broadly six like managing the required huge investment need from national international climate funds and development partners engaging private sectors for climate adaptation to release the burden from the uh, of the government increasing readiness of the government and through cap capacity building of institution knowledge management and skill development of marginals and develop fully operationalized adaptation monitoring and evaluation framework ensuring integrated management and implementation of prog programmatic approach instead of project uh, project ba uh, based approach and uh, required information of prescribed policy landscape and ensuring uh, multi-sectoral and in, uh, interministerial coordination. Uh, we uh, in if, if I could if I could just stop you there, I, I do apologize. Um, we have very little time. I think we managed to get get a lot of information out of there. There yeah. are six key challenges. Thank you so much for that. I'll I'll do a quick summary at at the end. Um, I'd like to okay. pose. The, 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 yeah, I do much. apologize. Time is so limited. Sincere apologies. Um, Matsuo-san, do, do you have a response to, to number one? If you could keep it within under one minute. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Linda-san. So I'll quickly highlight two points from the IPPLAT's point of view. So when it comes to the progress of formulation and implementation uh, of NAP, it varies greatly from country to country. So we need to understand each country's standing point accurately and understand the gaps and needs and then provide attentive support. When it comes to challenges, there are more works to be done in implementation and M&D in that process. So for example, only a limited number of countries could, uh, could calculate adaptation costs in their maps. I also realized from today's uh, other speakers' informative presentation that there are challenges to integrate maps into local planning process. So we need to firstly grasp the current status on understanding on climate change adaptation at local government levels. So to tackle those challenges, there are still, um, I mean, a lot of things to do. So in addition to referring to existing guidance from the UNSCCC and others, it is necessary to share the best practices and learn from each country or each local area in the, in the region to enhance uh, NAP formulation and implementation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that that um, that response. If we could move on, perfect. Move on to the second question: What role does the NAP formulation and implementation play in achieving the GGA? What actions are necessary to fill that role? And I'm going to pass that question to Mr. Tsukada. Okay, thank you, Rina san. Uh, uh, we believe that it is difficult to evaluate the validity of national adaptation measures in which the unique circumstances of each country and region should be uh, respected with the uniformized methodology. It is also difficult to uniformize global recommendations of specific adaptation measures as regional characteristics cannot be adequately reflected. Uh, Therefore, I think it is important to evaluate and uh, uh, understand the processes with the focus on the status of each country's systems and each institutions for national adaptation actions and to share good practices and to create enabling environment for investment for adaptation technology by clarifying sectors that need support. The development and implementation of NAPs uh, can contribute to any of those perspectives mentioned earlier. Uh, the status of the promotion system for adaptation measures and institutional arrangements can be monitored, and the pro progress can be regularly checked through this imp implementation. Thank you very much, Inda san Thank you so much, uh, Tsukada san uh, Matsuo san, can I pose that question to you as well? Uh, yes, thank you. So, yes, NAP has become an integral 
part of GJ discussions as a source of information to measure each country's adaptation progress and gap, along with other documents such as NDC, BTR, National Communication and Adaptation Communications. But in particular, it is a NAP is a core communication tool that allows details, detailed reporting of adaptation specific information. So also uh, formulation of NAP can help clarify what information is missing from countries adaptation plan. It can then develop a strategy for what programs, how much to budget and how to prioritize them in order to fill the gaps over the next five years or so, for example. So ultimately creating more elaborate NAPs will speed up the achievement of GGA. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Matsuo-san. Ms. Bello, how are you feeling? Do you think you could respond to that question? If not, it's no problem. We can move on to number three. Okay, so um, let's move on to number three, which I'm going to direct to Masutomi. What can we expect from international platforms and organizations such as APPLAT and APN? to achieve a climate resilient Asia Pacific region? Yes, yes, this question is quite interesting. What can we expect from APPRAT? So I, I, believe, I believe that we can expect everything from APPRAT, <laughs> everything. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, actually we intend to provide all the necessary information and tools for adaptation. That is a goal, an objective of the APPRAT. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, we really recognize that uh, the tool and information which we are providing now are uh, not enough, not enough. So, and also we recognize that we do not fully understand uh, the needs and the challenge in the Asia Pacific region and the Asia Pacific country. So yeah, as a concrete next action, we hope to have a more collaboration, direct collaboration, mutual collaboration. And through this collaboration, we understand their needs and the challenge and what are missing in APPRAT. We can understand such as things. And then we can go to the next step in the APPRAT. And we, we are now, I think we have already completed the basic development stage of APPRAT. And the next stage, we hope to uh, enhance our function through co direct collaboration with Asia Pacific countries. So that is, I think, next concrete action of APPRAT. And please expect everything from APPRAT. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, almost identical to what APN uh, has has uh, has written here, actually. Um, you know, APN is a science policy network. We generate climate resilient information through regional based research, through capacity development. And as a networking and funding organization, our role is to share the information and the knowledge that we generate. So regional networks and platforms address the gaps and challenges in preserving and sharing the climate information that's out there. We leverage opportunities to enhance accessibility and the use of this kind of information. We also use existing work and best practices in generating, synthesizing, sharing, and disseminating information related to adaptation. This also helps us to avoid duplication. And I think that's something that was key in our discussions last year. Um, not only do we help avoid duplication, but it allows us to transfer skills and to promote synergies. Uh, and we really need to continue establishing and taking advantage of platforms and networks and partnerships that really encourage and bring about information harmonization and uptake for climate resilient societies. Um, that's basically my response. I wrote it down, I do apologize because my head is full of other things. Um, with that, I do think we have a few minutes to open the floor 
do have uh, one line, but just before guys, um, for not pronouncing your name properly, from the Asia Regional, she's Asia Regional Coordinator of the Huairo Commission. Um, very happy to know about AP Platt, uh, who would like to bridge the stakeholders with scientists. And she's working with women-led organizations and will need capacity building for adaptation. How can we connect with you? Thank you. <laughs> Just send email to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lillian, if you put your email address into the chat, um, we will get back to you and we will let you know uh, how you can get in touch with AP Platt. I, I really hope that answers your question. Um, we still have a few minutes to go if there are no additional questions perhaps we can start to wrap up okay so with that i would like to take the opportunity to thank the panelists for putting you under pressure for your presentations and for the questions and um i would now like to hand the floor back to uh, dr yoshikawa who will end the session today. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. So, so. Uh, thank you very much, um, Linda San, for your excellent moderation. And thanks uh, to all the speakers for your fruitful discussion. I regret to say that there are only a few minutes left in this seminar. Now, I would like to ask Mr. Yasuo Takahashi, Executive Director, Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, or IGES, uh, to make the final remarks of this seminar. Uh, thank you, Yoshikawa san, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasuo Takahashi, uh, Executive Director of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, IGES. Uh, before I took my office, uh, took my position at IGES, I worked for the uh, Ministry, of, Ministry of the Environment for quite a long hour, years. And uh, in fact, I, I participated as the Vice Minister for Global Environmental Affairs at the launch event of, for AP Platt at the G20 meeting in 2019 held in Karizawa, Japan. The photo of this uh, ceremony was uh, presented by Mastomi san's uh, presentation, I think. And it was, it has been about three years since then, and I'm very delighted to see that AP Platt is generating a, a steady results. And we are able to hold today's session uh, here at COP27. As you might know, uh, COP27 has come to be known as the COP on adaptation. As we all know, climate change adaptation is becoming increasingly important. At COP26 last year, a decision was made to establish a work program on the, on the global goal on adaptation, or ZGA. This program has recently completed its fourth workshop, and we understand that discussions are, are making a good progress toward achieving the ZGA. One particular urgent issue is the implementation of adaptation measures in developing countries. And it goes with, without saying that the formulation of NAPS and their implementation are necessary elements to achieve this. The aim, the aim of today's session was to clarify the significance of NAP formulation and implementation based on the latest scientific findings. Through the excellent presentations and panel discussions, we have identified the current status, uh, good practices, initiatives, and challenges in addressing the impacts of climate change in the Asia Pacific region. As a result, we have uh, gained an understanding of the priority issues and the needs 
that developing countries should address in the future. Uh, I has, uh, it has also become clear that developing countries face limitations when formulating the, and implementing NAPs on their own. So it is especially important to work collaboratively with international initiatives such as APPLAT or APN. MOEJ, NICE, and IGES are leading efforts to expand such collaboration in the Asian Pacific region, and we can expect further progress in the near future. IGES is now contributing to overall APPLAT activities, including capacity buildings, developments, are one of the three pillars of APPLAT. We believe that in order to promote the implementation of climate change adaptation measures in the Asia Pacific region, it is not enough to simply identify issues and the needs. We must also uh, priori uh, properly implement specific actions based on those issues and needs. And uh, my, uh, the executive director of IGES, I am committed to supporting IGES staff to, so that uh, they can make a meaningful contribution to activities underpinning those actions through APPLAT. Let me conclude my remarks by expressing my hope that the resu results of those efforts can be presented at the very next opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Takahashi. This concludes the end of this seminar. We would like to ask the online participants to fill out the survey regarding today's seminar. The survey page will be displayed automatically after the Zoom session ends. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.